Hello and welcome to Beyond Top 10 Tennis. My name is Dr. Ashley Morgan Burge and I'm your host. I'm the author of 12 books, a CEO of 12 years, the founder of a startup center on data privacy, most importantly, an elite performance coach of over 18 years, having worked with athletes throughout Europe, the United States to Australia. Most excitingly, I am the world's leading scientist on coach and athlete performance, specifically behind how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking. My work includes everything from mitigating injuries to conditioning behaviors that set a player up long term for the long game towards a top 10 tennis ranking. I'm behind theories from the optimal performance theory, optimal behavior for optimal performance, the barrier breaker, the rule of transference to the golden rule. As has become custom, each episode we dive into one of my books to share additional insights and dig a little deeper. We've been focusing on the secrets to optimal coaching success, the role of experience, optimal performance practices and outcomes in the real world with over 60 episodes to date. Today's topic plays its own role like so many other episodes in developing the player, parent to coach for that road ahead towards a top 10 tennis ranking. So as always, buckle in and enjoy the ride. Thank you so much for joining us today. And look, for those of you who celebrate Christmas, irrespective where you're based around the world, I hope you've had the most wonderful Christmas ever. Uh, For those of you who don't, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, All the same, but I really wanted to um, start with that one because this episode will be coming out a couple of days after Christmas and it is a being recorded prior. So it's a little bit odd in that respect when those times do uh, come up. But all the all the more uh, important, I think, to just wish everyone, or all of my listeners, whether you, you are new or you've been with us all year, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And I wish the absolute happiness and uh, to you and your family and loved ones. Um, So thank you for bearing with me and sticking with us throughout the season. Look, today's episode, I wanted to, I think, focus especially on not not just today's um, core topic, but those of you who are familiar, um, the, the release of how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking, it has only been not even three weeks. So it's less than three weeks since it's launched. So it's, a, it's about two and, a, two and a half at this stage. And oh my goodness, thank you so, so much. But if you are new, I really want to encourage you to get your hands on it, especially with the 2024 season. Well, it's just, it's a few days away. But more so on that, it's so important with this new season, my hope and wish for each and every one of you for this coming season is to really uh, uh, grab a hold of those eight keys and cement them into your game. Because irrespective of, I think, what your core objective was this season, so for the 2023 season and the inroads you made, if you want to uh, gravitate even closer and progress closer towards that top 10 tennis ranking, please grab hold of that. Obviously, these episodes really do serve a purpose and that's what Beyond Top 10 Tennis was built for and is all about irrespective where you are on the pathway or the long game. And so that's for every single child who is a club player or academy player out there. You could be eight years of age, 18 years of age, or somewhere in between, or more so if you are on the WTA tour or the ATP tour, 
it, it's so much more powerful as as well so i i like to share that i accommodate both ends of the performance spectrum because i think that's something that's um overlooked and often forgotten because at the end of the day if you want to develop a top 10 tennis ranking you need to know how uh, but also you need to know how to stay there and my latest release really i think underlines how to get there and to stay there but more so i think the what is your game missing series showcases how what what it really takes from a technical perspective as well to not only achieve a top 10 tennis ranking but to stay there whereas this current uh text the secrets to optimal coaching success really shares or underscores how i can make sure that not only you're going to progress towards a top 10 tennis ranking but you're learning those fundamental skills required um to attain a top 10 tennis ranking within that 10 to 20 year pathway so recall i am your tennis coach and guru for those of you who are familiar with it and it really has that 10 year initial pathway especially if you are uh, say eight years of age towards 18 years of age for example that really sets the stage then for the second 10 years of play we term it as so when you are or you have turned professional so you progress from you know uh, the junior ranks to the senior ranks which really is a part of what today's topic uh, is all about but when you're making that transition so many players um, they fall by the wayside in manner of speaking and there are reasons why and it's incredibly disheartening because we've touched on it previously the argument really is if you're winning junior grand slams what's stopping you from progressing to win grand slams on the WTA and or ATP tour and really there shouldn't be anything if you've been integrating and implementing the the rulers the key technical parameters we we've, we've touched on and most importantly the eight keys and i think on that um those of you who are familiar with the eight keys or those who are familiar with just a few or those who have no idea what i'm talking about it's it's okay irrespective of where you're at but it also reflects your current ranking and so what it really comes up with is that over the last 11 years i've spent uh extensively uh, we can call it investigating researching scientifically unraveling just everything i think encompassed within that and we've had a few episodes around this and it got me thinking because i was talking to someone um over the weekend that's just been and how how i explained it to them was science is science so science is factual and which essentially means it's not something you can argue with it is fact um which means it's it's been extensively investigated you've got all these um different data sources coming in and which shows you that ultimate endpoint and you can look at that on a micro scale a macro scale it's perhaps akin to someone saying who are the current top 10 players and you look at the current rankings and you go there it is and then another person might say no that, that that's not it and your rids are right in front of you and you're looking in your sources then are they exact obviously the WTA ATP the points etc and then if someone says to you no that's not it you, you p- potentially going to be quite dumbfounded because it, it's right there in front of your face that's one example uh the other example is that you could say um you graduated high school and truthfully you did and you went on and did an undergraduate degree at university and you're really proud of yourself because you know there's a lot of work involved in that and then the, the another person comes along and you share that with them and they say to you no you didn't 
And you said, well, no, I, I did. I've got the, the proof. This is all the work that I did. That's another. Hopefully you see where I'm going. So I, I won't continue with those examples, but they're everywhere. And the irony here is that, unfortunately, that these are the conversations I come up against um, on a regular basis. And they're really disheartening because science is science and fact is fact. And it's often not believed and that's what's so staggering about this is that it's so exciting to be able to share it is that we have the data that showcases that this is fact this can be it's actually a world first to have a pathway for that eight-year-old to follow towards a top 10 tennis ranking it's a pathway for that top 20 player to know how what their game is missing to allow them to cross the threshold into the top 10 it's the same for a top 200 player to know what they need to do to break into the top 100 to ensure they're obviously getting even closer and closer to ensure their uh, entry into you know, grand slams throughout the year, which we all know is so incredibly important. And it is, I think, so powerful in itself then with my latest release, How to Develop a Top 10 Tennis Ranking, because it really pieces, I think, these endpoints together. Though on that, it's even more important, I think, than to share the eight keys and where that came from and whilst there's so much data out the information the pathway etc what i wanted to do because it feeds back directly to the data and and how we learn so recall the humanized approach that i touch on each and every episode or i try to it's really looking at irrespective of what you do whether you play tennis um, you're learning to become an accountant it does not matter what you are doing you're learning a new skill a hobby as we are human we learn in different ways but to achieve something a given skill what we typically need to commit ourselves to learn and as individuals so here's that humanized approach we learn in different ways and I've touched on that in, in different and ep- varying episodes as well and so what this does is something that no coach education provider globally has done before as well so this is what this is what makes it even more powerful it accommodates that it, it it goes okay irrespective of how you learn we need to figure out what that means to you and and, and that's a uh, schematic and now we're going to say have a triangle but let's flip it upside down because at the very tip of that triangle um, or depending how you want to look at it is that top 10 tennis ranking but also beyond that is grand slam championships how to achieve replicated success which is more than one grand slam which means yes we've got the data that underscores why Djokovic for example continues to win grand slams the data why Swiatek has been so successful at such a young age with multiple grand slams to her name to even projecting uh, Gorf's um, grand slam win at the USO Open, and that a few years ago she was on track but not just yet even though people were predicting her very early on at that age and I was going no not yet even though she's exceptional just not yet give it that two three years which ended up it ended up being because that's when she was prime to peak and we do have episodes around, you know, those uh, performance cycles, uh, uh, those patterns, periodization, etc. But also when we're looking at discrete skills, serious, serial skills. Um, but what is inadvertent throughout all of our episodes and all of these texts is that coaching pedagogy. And it's a really big, I think, buzzword in education to varying, I think, scientific art. Uh, literature etc but essentially I view it as and I and this is how I encourage you to view it as it's your moral compass it is how you learn how you talk to other people if um, 
you, you're on the same wavelength, different types of understandings. So it's quite diverse in that respect, but I, I won't elaborate any further on that. But so becoming a top 10 tennis player or progressing towards it is so much more than how you play the game. Um, I think most alarmingly something a very recent um, came to light and it was on social media and I am a bit cautious to, to share this but I w- will just share the, those uh, my two cents is that Simona Halep unfortunately has been banned at, at this stage etc for um, being found with XX in her um, I won't go into it but we know anti-doping etc around those who are not familiar Google will, will fill you in but please do your due, due diligence her coach at the time which I, I won't name but again if you go to Google you will see and unfortunately they were responsible for supplying Halep with what was found in her blood sample which is not permitted under you know anti-doping regulations etc etc but what is I think more upsetting from an ethical coaching standpoint because recall that um, I am so proud to be a coach as well and that I have worked with athletes around the world um, junior development through to high performance through to elite and having a coach at that uh, caliber or that level not standing up for his athlete very early on and taking responsibility and being accountable is very upsetting because because this athlete Simona Halep has essentially been through this by herself when there was so much trust in, um, shared with that coach and or coaching team and for it to now be I, I want to say over 12 months or almost since, since the initial ban and er, or everything that happened and for it only to come to light now is very upsetting because we know the harm that has happened to that player's uh, integrity, career, and we've also had episodes on mental health. And those of you who are, who are familiar with me, and but also you know the earlier episodes around that, mental health is incredibly important and to be managed for that athlete's well-being. And we have some, had some athletes speak up. And Osaka, I think, is first that comes to light. And I think it got a lot of uh, negative um, feedback, which is very disheartening because, again, with that humanized approach, every single person out there, whether they want to admit it or not, has something um, to do with their mental health that they need to manage. And whether you manage that through your fitness, um, going for a run daily, going to the gym, going for a walk to get some fresh air, um, setting those boundaries, irrespective, your mental health is front and center. And it has been around for such a long time, but under different words, whether it's your mental strength, your mental toughness, your mental conditioning. And again, I've touched on this in previous episodes. Now, I think mental health went through a very uh, big period, like this, for the last almost 20 years plus, that it was a very negative, st- very bad st- stigma around it. And I think only in the last, you know, two, three years, uh, courtesy of COVID, I would say, has the discussion been more widespread, but in a more positive light, is that it's really your well-being, your health and well-being, and which obviously your mental health falls under. So those of you who think there's a negative connotation there, I really want to help you lead the way with me to switch it to it's your it's encompassed in your well-being, your health and well-being, and it is obviously your mental, emotional and physical health, which we obviously can manage in different ways. So and what I'm saying here though, is that there are so many negative repercussions there in that generalized well-being for that athlete, which is Simona Halep in this case, especially when her support network, so that team ha- has not been there in the way they um, thought. 
and where they imparted so much trust. And how this is relevant is that how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking and again that coaching pedagogy, how it ties into that coach-athlete relationship. So again, recall I think countless episodes we've touched on that coach-athlete relationship and trust is absolutely fundamental. And for that to be broken and not to have that, I think that coach, can, a consistent figure, it's broken. That is incredibly disheartening. And it, it actually up, ups, upsets me as well because, I'll bet from a distance, because I can see this the, the break in that coach-athlete relationship. And that break means that, no, that, that top 10 tennis ranking, it, it's no more which we know and for a coach to potentially take advantage of an athlete is so incredibly wrong and unethical and not to I think take that level of responsibility and accountability when it really counted and this is what I think it all talks about Um, it's because it's not just the player but it's also the coach and those of who, you who are familiar with my text, you know what the golden rule is. And you'll hear that in my intros um, consistently because it's such an important ingredient to not only achieve a top 10 tennis ranking, but longevity. So we have a number of players who stay inside the top 10 for more than one year, two year, five years, uh, eight years, etc., which is absolutely staggering compared to a lot more players who regress after one season or two seasons. So we know, and again, it's it has been written about, so it's theirs. It is accessible for you to know how, which means if you are inside the top 10, if you do not want to be a part of that 2% that regress each and every season as a minimum, this is absolutely fundamental. But again, recall in our previous episodes how I've shared how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking uncovers and shares 92% of coaches on the WTA and ATP tours do not know the eight keys. And this is why only 8% of players know the eight keys and why those 8% are currently inside the top 10. However, 2% of players inside the top 10, so obviously to account for that 10%, will regress every season because they lose hold of one and or more key. Now, I don't think I can be any more clear than that. Uh, If you need to hear that again, please rewind and then rewind again and rewind again, please, because it is so important. Now, why it has taken 12 texts well it's really 11 texts because remember I've got one book in there that was my fictional release but over the span of 11 texts is it's it's incredible learning process and so recall at the beginning of the episode how I shared that how individuals learn how humans learn but also it's a process. It's not something you just learn overnight or over a week or over a month. It's a staggered approach. And what the data tells us is that it is necessary to follow this design and or approach if you want to ascend towards a top 10 tennis ranking, if you want to develop further and evolve, if you want to progress from that 14 year old playing at club level to eventually playing ITF events. If you want to progress from ITF events to ascending towards that 600, 400 in the world and then steadily progress towards 200, 150, 125, then all of a sudden 90 in the world. How to crack each ranking range and their respective thresholds. 
and then eventually for that top 50 player, top 30 player, top 20 player to cross the threshold and become a barrier breaker, we term it, and ascend inside the top 10. But how long are you capable of staying inside the top 10? And this is a really important slash exciting discussion, which is relevant for the senior junior, I, th- I think, um, discussion as well. Because there's a reason why when players ascend so rapidly and they're inside the top 10, or all of a sudden they have a breakthrough at the Australian Open, which is just around the corner, and then you never hear of them again, that they're not capable of repeating that those type of results. And the reason behind that is because all of a sudden they become privy to the eight keys. And all of a sudden their game just goes, bam, it comes together. And then it's forgotten. Because the work has not been done over an extended period of time to recall what's really necessary. I'm going to use Djokovic as an example here because he has been absolutely exceptional as the sole uh, remaining player. Uh, Nadal is coming back, though at this stage it is just Djokovic who continues to win Grand Slam after Grand Slam. It's really exceptional. But I'm, I say this, but when all three or all four were active, so Serena, Nadal, Federer and Djokovic, there were similarities as in why they were, they kept coming back for more and they kept winning. And it's because those points of recall were ingrained in their game, but also there was that level of maintenance that they were capable of. Nadal has not been able to maintain because he's obviously been sidelined. Djokovic has been able to maintain, but it's not just the level, it's that continued level of commitment application, integration of those eight keys. There's no hiccup. It's an absolute level of commitment that really needs to be recognized that differentiates him from other top 10 players. And it was the same as applicable to Serena. What's at the moment, Swiatek is very similar that differentiates her with obviously clocking up those multiple grand slams. What's really going to be interesting if Sabalenka is able to, let's say, um, defend her Australian Open title, the likelihood actually is quite high because she still did have a very strong season. Let's see if Pagula can claim her first Grand Slam or Gorf can go back to back or reach the semi-finals. When we're looking at the Djokovic, um, at Djokovic, it, I'd be very surprised if he didn't ascend. But we need to remember that even top 10 players have glitches, that they may have um, a weaker moment or they could come up against a player who's absolutely exceptional on the day. So we're looking at these consistent markers and the What Is Your Game Missing series shows you and teaches you what those consistent markers are. Sabalenka features in one of those texts, for example, and, and showcases why Asaka does too, Swiatek does too. Swiatek features uh, when she was ranked 80 in the world and shows that she was primed to win a Grand Slam. So it's really cool because it, obviously all of this was published before this happened. Same with Sabalenka. And obviously a couple of years later, bam, she won her Grand Slam. Same with golf. So everything I'm sharing was actually in print before it came to fruition because they were key uh, predictive analytics, if you like, that shared what was going to happen if these were built on, if they um, integrated the seven keys at that time and now the eight keys that really underscores this. And some people are surprised why Djokovic again keeps coming back for more, but not me, because he's able to maintain. And when there comes a time where he's not, that's where it becomes okay. Alcaraz, however, not surprised because he's been able to ascend. Uh, Bedos is a very good example at the moment because she's regressed outside the top 10. But this was also predicted because whilst her game was also predicted to improve and she had those key indicators, 
it was not ready at this stage for the top 10, but she cracked into the top 10 very rapidly. Um, from, from memory, she started the season around 90, 80 in the world, ended it inside the top 10. What's important though, is that it was rapid. And, and that's where the warning is. Same with Radicanu, it was rapid and then regressed. But so it should, because we want the regression so then we can have the steady progression. Or on the other side, we want the very steady progressions, but the danger is when it's rapid fire, is that you need to maintain that. Do you have the tools to maintain that? Now, the eight keys and this volume of work now with these 11 tags shows you how to maintain it. So if you are one of those rapid fire players, please get a hand on the collection because we want you to be able to maintain your hold. If you regress, that that's okay. Let's get you progressing again. Um, hopefully with what I'm sharing, I have been simplifying the how behind it because at the end of the day, how is, is absolutely fundamental. Now let's draw the discussion back then to the, the seniors and the juniors and I think the transition because the pressure is obviously synonymous and it's also universal irrespective if you're a top 10 junior player to a top 10 uh, professional player. Um, there are varying amounts of pressure and I would say in equal amounts because of the given age because obviously as you get older you know how to manage that better. Um, what becomes problematic is for the younger players so think Swear Tech to Alcaraz who were in their teens when they ascended into the top 10. They were in their teens when they won their maiden green slam championships which means you have a very steep learning curve to be able to deal with that pressure and you really rely on that support network around you and we do have episodes on that triangular approach for example uh, but what's really important is that we it's also evident for those players who succeed very early on in their teens and then regress um, from the top of my head, I'm trying to recall the player. I want to say um, Puig, when she won gold at the Olympics, there was, it was quite surprising, but that level of play was not being able to, was unable to be maintained. Austin Penko, when she won her grand slam, that was wow, it was not expected at that time. I recall my data was not tracking that at that given time. But again, that was somewhat surprising um, when we're looking back on that. However, that level of maintenance at that time was not. So it was almost a shock to their system for, for, for that player. However, what that player has been able to do, they've been able to progress again. So they did the work and they learned how to maintain. And oh my goodness, is Austin Penko a dangerous player now? These are just examples that have come out of the woodworks as a matter of uh, just a colloquial expression. Now we do have some ATP tour players who have done that, but it's more uh, inconsistent. Uh, Kyrgios, for example, I think has to be a favourite progressing to the Wimbledon finals. That was not necessarily anticipated. However, he has been a player for an extended period of time that has very powerful aspects of his game that if they just found their way, if they were maintained and sustained, it was definitely on the card. So it wasn't necessarily surprising that he did make the final. However, for that player to maintain that throughout an entire season, that's yet to be seen. And that's, I think, what, what we're talking about is that level of maintenance we term it. So throughout an entire season, a top 10 player typically should be making the round of 16 or further at every single Grand Slam. 
which means so this hopefully will perk all those ears up whether you're in the top 10 progressing towards the top 10 irrespective of where you are or you're one of their coaches or part of their team and the message is loud and clear round of 16 at the australian open police if you're a top 10 player and you're not making the round of 16 at at least three out of the four it should be four but i'll give you that leniency for a hiccup three out of four you are a part of the two percent that will more likely be displaced throughout the season and rightly so because players not inside of the top 10 who are capable of making a round of 16 or further watch out and players who have done that range from Ons de Burr, yes, she was one of those players. Swiatek, she was one of those players. Sabalenka, Gorf, one of those players. Kyrgios, even some time back, almost was on that radar. Alcaraz, one of those players. Bedosa, <laughs> one of those players. Um, the, the list goes on. And it's very important to remember that. Um, and there are a, a lot more players there. There are just some key players that come to mind um, at this stage. Makova was one of those players. And there are very uh, powerful indicators in this respect. We have more, I think, um, ATP Tour players um, inside the top 10 who have typically been regressing and or have progressed inside the top 10 because they've made that round of 16 results. Sinner, for example, was one of them before he was inside the top 10. Shapovalov, um, yes, um, Felix, I'm going to say. I'm not going to try to say his last name because I'm going to mispronounce it. Then that would not be very um, respectful. Both of those players, one of them. Once upon a time, Rayanich was one of them consistently before obviously he was sidelined but I think he is coming back at um, this year's tournament so there is a number of players and it's not just one or two or three these are key markers we're talking about that I don't typically share however they are available in the what is your game missing series are uh, quite extensively across both tours and what's so important I think now is that let's touch on why we're not seeing um, the same level Level of pro progress or the same um, ascension from a junior uh, grand slam towards a senior. Now, as I shared on, I think, early in today's episode, is that when you're looking at that transition, we go those that initial 10 years of play, if that player has not been set up for that second decade of play, of course, they're going to drop off. And that is why we see so many juniors that are really good. They're really solid. They're winning those junior grand slams. But you know what? They are unable to crack the top 50. They will hover. They will, they will get inside the top 200, top 100 typically. But rarely do they ascend past top 50, let alone the top 20. And that this is a really important statistic. Uh, more alarmingly though, is that why? Why are these players unable to? However, we really need to remember, and I've touched on this in previous episodes, is that a lot of these players end up getting injured because they do too much too soon in that 10 years and longevity is not even of discussion. And I cannot even tell you how many players I see under 18 years of age who are already taped up on court on a regular basis and it's been normalized. But I can tell you what the likelihood of them making it um, into their second decade of play or to the end of that second decade. So for argument's sake, let's say their second decade starts at 18, so it goes 18 to 28. You will typically see by the time they're 24, 25, that they've regressed and or that no, they, they are not able to maintain that level throughout their, you know, 25, 26, 27, and they go back and or typically in their early 20s, so 22, 23, 24, there's some type of big injury and type of surgery. And look, again, with that humanized approach, it is not normal. It is not 
normal. I will repeat that for a 23, 24 year old to need surgery that early on. If you are a 34, 35 or in your early 30s and you've been playing at the top level inside the top 20, top 10 for an extended period of time, then we can look at potentially something needs to be done. Andy Murray is obviously a prime example um, in that respect, unfortunately. Del Potro, unfortunately, um, those things did happen and they do happen. Federer, even at the end of his career, and Nadal, who has endured different ones throughout his career. And I'd say Djokovic has been quite lucky in this respect. Although there are different reasons why and also recall in our previous episodes uh, we did touch on genetics and also the levels of susceptibility in this respect. Back to the juniors though, what happens is that a lot of these coaches when they're working with a junior they over uh, train them, they overrun them, they're not looking at those peak performance patterns, they don't care about that second decade of play, they want peaks now, parents are also guilty of this and so the parents out there listening remember the triangular relationship touch on previous episodes to catch up on that but it's also your responsibility the parents and the guardians to safeguard that child that you for the coaches out there it's also your responsibility to put their safety front and center if their passion for the game is there It's not going to kill them to take an extra three, four years to progress towards the top 50, top 20. Um, Head on over to AIMA International. Look at the long game and the markers there. Between 18 years of age to even 30 years of age, there are markers on what it takes to progress from, say, 800 in the world to 500 in the world. And there are clear markers from, you know, 100 to 50 in the world, etc., and time frames. And so we're looking at that one to two years per. So we're looking at if you allow yourself that 10 years or five to 10 years, these are just baseline figures. And it is shared in I'm Your Tennis Coach and Guru and the seven keys to optimize your life and how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking that you can fast track once you have a level of maintenance and a steady level of uh, progression. However, what we want is that for it to be steady and progressive. And it's not necessarily, there's no need to for rapid fire because that's where the juniors, they, they fall off. They succumb to ailments and they're not able to sustain that level of play that got them to a grand slam, a junior grand slam final or the win. And what got them to, you know, number one in the world in the junior rankings. And all of a sudden they turn professional and they are unable to even crack the top 50. Now, we know there are reasons why. And so for every single junior out there, I'm on your side. I want you to progress towards a top 10. And that is what all this work is about. But you know what? If you are in the top 10, I'm also on your side because I want you to stay there. I want you to win even more Grand Slams. I'm on your side. Um, One of, I think, the most uh, fun facts that I've shared in previous episodes is that there's a reason why more top 10 players on the WTA tour have a grand slam compared to the ATP tour. And you know what? The reason is not because Djokovic keeps getting them all. It's because the level of play inside the top 10 um, on the ATP tour is not, I think, an equilibrium of sorts uh, in a manner of speaking it's because those eight keys that Djokovic has a, a, a hold of you've got top 10 players that do not have a hold of those eight keys WTA tour you've got more players who have a grasp on the eight keys um, in contrast to uh, those that do not and it's a really powerful discussion to be had now i think this has been a lot to begin with um and i'm, I'm really happy with i think the depth we've been able to share but before we close off today's episode let's just share i think a, a little bit from the, the section on performance pressure junior versus uh, senior now if you want to follow along we are on page 99 Entering the ranks of the sporting world is no mean feat. 
often overwhelming for the majority of players and or athletes. There is a transitional phase that allows this performance pressure to settle. Yet, this is dependent on a variety of factors, mainly coexisting with age and performance expectations. Now, I think the last bit there, performance expectations, is the big one. And recall again that triangular relationship and what those expectations are to the long game. Are you expecting rapid fire? Are you expecting that, you know, from top 100 through to top 20 in the space for season? Or are you giving, I think, that leg room going, let's get to 50. If, if you get to top 20, that's a bonus. So it's really removing the pressure in this respect. Let's move it to something that's more manageable, less stressful, a different term there for pressure as well, depending how I think the player or athlete uh, handles it. So circle back to mental health, general uh, your well-being and every player athlete's going to handle I think pressure in different ways and that's a really important discussion to be had but also something uh, the coach athlete relationship should account for through expectation pressure is born by removing expectation pressure is merely a notion that is yet to affect the player athlete and their resultant performances when considering the role of expectation and its ultimate growth and thus place at the helm of performance pressures, its birth is undermined by the opinions of those expressed to the player athlete through their development, spanning the length of their sporting endeavours. Now, what this is really saying is that let the player control where they want to go and their expectations and then it should be the coach's responsibility to mitigate it uh, to mitigate that level of pressure not the other way around it's not about the coach setting the expectations or the parent or guardian setting the expectation or the sponsors setting the expectations let the player set the expectations and then for the coach to manage the pressure so it could be top 200 to 100 in the space of a season sure this is achievable but as your pressure Let, let's look at the ratios involved there that we previously i think touched on let's look at those peak performance cycles uh, and it's not necessarily a discussion about the likelihood it's let's let's get to work let's make this happen but you know what if you're not um, inside the top 100 by the end of the season it's okay let's reflect on what happened why this wasn't attainable but let's go for it again next season or even better let's solidify the eight keys into your game so we know it is not only going to happen but you're going to continue to progress inside the top 100 in the next two three four five years towards you to <laughs> until you progress towards the top 20 and ultimately the top 10 it is possible that's the most exciting part about how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking is that it's finally here often the notion of pressure is kept for the senior players or athletes those who have been successful enough in their sport of choice to form a career as a professional player athlete these are the athletes or players the world watches in detail at world cups grand slams and or grand finals and so forth these seniors in turn become icons idols and carry the weight of their sport without reprieve on their shoulders this is a very i think ironic discussion because we need to remember professional players and the topic of senior is very or should be very loosely used and i say that in respect to you have senior professional tennis players as teenagers these days so remember that humanized approach if you're not a sporting um, professional and you are 18 years of age no way is your maturity level the same as a 35 40 year old we, we know that and you have um, adults who are in their 30s uh, who have become parents for example and they're considered as a senior um, but by no means senior as in life 
Uh, so we're looking at adults. So ironically, when we look at the adult tour, the professional tour perhaps is a better way of saying it. Still, if you're the 18, 19 year old, you are just at the beginning. You, you are so young and when you have all that pressure on your shoulders and you are that role model it's a very uh, treacherous path in a manner of speaking if it is not managed um, accordingly that's why it's so important to have a really healthy coach athlete relationship and i think what's so um, impressive here in the best possible way is both Tech and Alcaraz had been with their coaches and still are for an extended period of time before they cracked the top 10 and obviously ultimately went on to win their respective grand initial grand slams. Um, obviously, Swiatek's leading the way in that respect. But it's the longevity there. And that's a really big secret that's wrapped up in these books. And we do have some rulers, wink, wink, around there, which is so important because you obviously have that level of trust. So that's circling back to that earlier topic. It's also that guidance to keep you on the straight and narrow in a manner of speaking. And all that adult figure that is a constant along, I think, who's consistent in that triangular relation to make sure, um, I think, you are on the pathway and you're progressing through the long game. Uh, not only towards that top 10 tennis ranking, but they have your general well-being, hopefully, uh, front and centre. And I think we're going to finish on that because we are getting towards the end. And I really want to share more insights on this later on. But again, when you're looking at the senior to junior and the transition there and the discussion around a senior player still being a teenager, obviously that's not always the case, but you still get... Uh, senior players in their early 20s which is again or even their late 20s and again that humanized approach we know in the real world and I say that with um, air quotes that know that that's not necessarily how it needs to be viewed so there's a very big stigma around that and the pressure I think is at times unwarranted but I think that's also the nature of sport and how it needs to be managed and why it's so important to have a support network around you one that you can trust and that can help guide you and why when we're looking at how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking it really is the player and the coach and the team it's not just a one uh, person show and I think on that I wish the coaches would get um, even more credit looked after even better because we have the data that also shows that it is not just the player responsible for obviously um, achieving that top 10 tennis ranking it is the coach as well and especially when it is um, long term and that's on their side and it's not just a six month contract for example it's even we know it's even more powerful and we do have the data that backs that which is even more exciting of course that's not to say those those one-off occasions where it could be that three month six month that is equally i think very powerful um depending on obviously that age of that athlete and or their background and or if they've come in temporarily and or at a key stage which which we know so this really is a discussion on the younger players the longevity when we're talking about pressure so i want to be very uh, explicit or clear that's where the conversation is around that's very important because there are other markers that support um, those shorter term appointments um that that is something to get in um later on so look at the end of the day if you're looking at heading towards that top 10 tennis ranking how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking is for you um especially this season the Australian Open is just around the corner and look I wish for each and every one of you this new year which again is just around the corner to progress closer and closer and nudge and descend further closer ah, towards that top 10. Thank 
you so much for joining us today. I know the end of finish. It's a little bit really quickly and then subtly, subtly um, in that respect because, you know, the season is just around the corner. Christmas has just passed us. And, oh, my goodness, it's just one of those times of year, year, especially for the tennis season, where there's an overlap there. A top 10 tennis ranking, it is yours. How to develop a top 10 tennis ranking is here. But we're really just piecing together those moving parts and especially pressure. And the beginning of the season, typically, uh, pressure is... Uh, front and center and almost paramount but i want to ensure or try to help you manage that in i think the most conducive ways possible and look to grab your copy of the secrets to optimal coaching success head on over to aima international to grab your copy of my new release how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking you can also find it on aima international or on amazon irrespective where you are based around the world now for any comments or questions head on over to aima international national or topic thread the social platform set on data privacy and to interact with beyond top 10 tennis head on over to twitter threads or instagram to catch up on our weekly coaching tips head on over to tiktok and to catch up on our blogs head on over to aim international and look for our blog tab or head on over to medium and as always i'll leave all the links in the episode notes uh, for something different head on over to pink octopus books as where my fiction release is to view this week's question and poll be sure to visit spotify if you're listening on one of those other many other platforms or for something left of field visit spruik for some random polls and of course if you enjoyed today's episode please subscribe like share and or all of the above would be absolutely phenomenal uh, for those of you who are interested, we do have scholarships available on AIM International, as well as options to work with me exclusively to optimize your performance to nudge you closer towards that top 10 tennis ranking. And this is so important with pressure. 2024 season around the corner with the Australian Open. If you want to be nudged closer and closer, recall that round of 16. Let's get you to the round of 16 or further every single grand slam throughout the 2024 season so don't be shy and come and say hi on that note thank you so much for listening i am so incredibly grateful i'm your host dr ashley morgan burge and this is beyond top 10 tennis and i'll see you next time